Distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, after all that Mr. Vail said and after all that we have experienced and heard and felt tonight, I feel very much as I did when I was coming down on an elevator once in Philadelphia and a man got on board about the fifth floor and he said, I hear Billy Graham is on this elevator. And a man pointed at me and said, yes, there he is. And the man looked me up and down for about 30 seconds and he said, my, what an anti-climax. <laughs> I was given orders by the doctors about three weeks ago that I was not to deliver a speech for at least two months. And I said, all right, I'll cancel everything but the one in Cleveland. I will not cancel that. I'm going to come here because I considered it to be one of the great moments of my life to receive this award and to have the opportunity of being in this great city at this particular time. And it reminded me of a story of a man that was in the hospital. And the, he had had a very serious coronary. And the doctor had left instructions that he was to take the medicine on one day, and then he was to skip a day, and then take it the next day. And so on the third day, a nurse came and saw him skipping up and down the hall. And she said, man, what are you doing? You'll have another coronary. It'll kill you. He said, I know. He said, I'm about to die of pain now. But the doctor said, take the medicine one day and skip a day. And this is my day to skip. <laughs> so I have skipped in order to be here tonight. But I'm honored and humbled to be the recipient of this award tonight. I suppose that I'm the first Christian evangelist to receive an award like this from so distinguished a pluralistic organization. The National Conference of Christians and Jews has done much to further tolerance and understanding between Christians and Jews as well as other minority and majority groups throughout America. A 19th century French scholar once said, I shall not try to write the history of intolerance. That would be to write the history of the world. He was correct. And yet there is room for the right kind of intolerance. Moses refused to tolerate the idolatry into which ancient Israel had fallen in his absence when God gave him the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Nathan the prophet showed his intolerance of the sins of adultery and murder when he pointed to King David and said, Thou art the man. Israel's ancient prophets were intolerant as they denounced the personal and social sins of both Israel and the heathen nations round about them. All of this is a far cry from the contemporary postures in which the quest for toleration has sometimes resulted in meaningless broad-mindedness, ethical relativism, and ambiguous sentimentalism. Certainly breadth of understanding and charity are called for. However, our Judeo-Christian heritage is persistent in its demand for biblical intolerance in certain areas. Too often, Tolerance has included compromise of conviction, a yielding to expediency on primary matters. In moral issues, over-tolerance has made us morally soft and devoid of conviction. We've become so tolerant as Americans that we've become accustomed to unbelievable crime, the drug culture, pornography, obscenity, ghettos, poverty, pollution, and the deep spiritual cry of a whole generation of young people that are searching for purpose and meaning in their lives. I don't have to remind you that science is narrow-minded and intolerant. There's no room for broad-mindedness in the laboratory. And just so, 
There are some moral, social, and religious convictions that all of us hold in common and separately that cannot be compromised. If we understand and allow for this, then we can make common cause in many things as believers in God and citizens in America. Let's don't hide our differences under a basket. Let's follow the counsel of Martin Buber, who said this, quote, don't try to score points or defeat your opponent. Understand him. Respect his uniqueness. Establish a warm relationship, end quote. Rabbi Howard Singer said in the Saturday Evening Post, January 28, 1967, quote, when Christians and Jews get together to discuss religious differences, I sigh and shake my head. The sad fact is that when laymen engage in theological dialogue, they cheerfully exchange superficialities and misinformation. And when clergymen or scholars do, they walk gingerly around certain topics like infantrymen poking their way through a minefield." End quote. I had a long talk with the chief rabbi in Israel some time ago. I asked him if he believed in the coming of Messiah, and he assured me that he did. And I told him that I too believed in the coming of Messiah, but that when Messiah comes, we will all recognize that he is Jesus who was on earth once before. And the chief rabbi smiled over his cup of coffee and said, of course, that's our difference. When I was 17, I was living on a farm south of Charlotte, North Carolina. I was reared in a very orthodox Presbyterian church. I rebelled against the hard work on the farm, and I rebelled against the strict religious teachings of the church. But one day, something happened to me that's as fresh in my mind tonight as it was that day. I met Jesus Christ face to face, a Jew who was born in Bethlehem and reared in Nazareth. I became convinced that in his death on the cross, he died for my sins. I felt my own need of personal repentance. I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. I've walked with him for 37 years since then. And during the past 30 years, I have proclaimed his message on every continent of the globe. My intellectual hang-up about Jesus came from this statement that he made. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. On the surface, that seemed to me to be the most intolerant statement I'd ever heard. Think of any man coming on the stage of human history claiming to be the supreme embodiment of all psychological, scientific, and religious truth. He was either an egomaniac, a liar, or he was what he claimed to be by faith. I accepted him for what he claimed to be the son of the living God. That simple decision changed my life. And I'm here tonight because of that commitment made 37 years ago. And I believe 10,000 times more firmly now than I did that November night that he is the savior of the world. Now I've grown in understanding since that hour of personal commitment. But it was that decision that has made me intolerant of the social and personal evils of this generation. As a Southerner, I began to wrestle almost immediately in my conscience with the question of race, and I'd never even heard at that time of segregation or integration. As soon as I began to study the Bible in earnest, I realized the debt that I owed to Israel. And it's to the lasting glory of Judaism and Christianity that they have their deepest roots in the scriptures largely written by Jews. 
and no greater words have been penned than those of the Mosaic Code and the Sermon on the Mount. As never before, the world needs to accept the ethical principles and follow the moral standards outlined by Moses and the Sermon on the Mount. Through their use, social injustice and moral evil can be greatly reduced, if not eliminated. If this Holy Scriptures were proclaimed fearlessly and lived faithfully, our world could be changed for the better. There are theological differences between Catholics, Protestants, and Jews that are here tonight. We may never agree on all of them, but there are certain things that we can work together for now that could make a better America. First, we can work and pray together for the peace of Jerusalem. The Bible indicates that the last battle of history will be fought there. It's going to be called Armageddon. In the midst of Armageddon, God is going to intervene. Messiah will come and set up his kingdom. The capital of the whole world is going to be Jerusalem. Then will the prophecy be fulfilled spoken by Isaiah the prophet in the 19th chapter and the 25th verse. Quote, Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Syria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance, end quote. Till that glorious day, we are to work and we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Secondly, Christians and Jews must continue to work together for better race relations in America. Black and white, Jew and Gentile, majority and minority, all the ethnic groups working together to build a better and a more united country. No nation in history has attempted to solve its racial problems as has America. We now have the most extensive civil rights laws on our statute books in world history. Now if all this is happening in America, why do racial tensions continue to mount? as we have been reminded tonight. I'll tell you why. It's because hearts have not been changed. This is why Jesus said long ago, you must be born again. There must be a change in attitudes. We must recognize that skin color does not matter to God. God looks on the heart. And love alone will serve to make good laws work. The one weapon that no one can resist is a genuine, sincere, unaffected love for people regardless of race, color, or religion. Those who love God have a moral responsibility to work at the business of racial friendship and racial justice on and off the job at every waking hour. Thirdly, we can join in honoring and supporting and undergirding our nation. This nation has not yet gone to the dogs. We're still the greatest nation in the world. And last year, And last year, when we participated in the Honor America Day on July 4th, you would be amazed at the clergy that wrote me, tearing me apart for honoring America. I gladly and proudly honor this country and wave that flag. No country in the world has treated its minorities better than America. Every American Christian, black and white, 
every American Jew should wave the stars and stripes and thank God that here on these shores he has found a land of freedom and opportunity second to none. <laughs> Fourthly, we can hammer out together a common agreement for returning prayer to the public schools. I am totally against the state imposing set forms of prayer or demanding that all pray. But students should have the right to pray silently on a voluntary basis or to repeat prayers used in the Supreme Court or in the Congress. I also believe that the Bible should be read in the public schools limited even to the Ten Commandments. Our children need to know there is a moral law. Fifthly, we can cooperate in solving the religious education problem. America has always been pluralistic. From 1789, by constitutional choice, Church and state have been separated. I am totally committed to such separation. However, our public schools have been so influenced by unbelieving secularists that I believe my children and grandchildren would be greatly benefited by attending religiously oriented schools where God is revered, respected, and honored. Religious-oriented schools all over the nation, especially Roman Catholic, are threatened with bankruptcy due to the lack of funds. <coughs> if they fail, it will place an enormous burden upon the public school system that is already overburdened. It seems wrong in principle to me for people to be taxed to support truly secular education while at the same time having to pay for educating their children in church schools. Americans should not be required to pay to propagate religious beliefs they don't believe in. But Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish Americans are now helping to pay for materialistic, atheistic teaching in some places that they do not believe in. And in some instances, the teaching is anti-Christian and anti-Semitic. I call tonight for some creative solution to this complex problem, perhaps through dual enrollment, tax rebates, or tuition grants to students to be used where they please, assuming that it's racially integrated. No child ought to be involuntarily subjected to educational processes that will corrupt his religious heritage. There must be true freedom of choice. There must be true freedom of choice, and that choice must include Jewish and Christian schools that take students regardless of the color of their skins. Sixthly, we can work together for world peace, freedom, and justice. But it should be the right kind of peace. Is there peace tonight in the Soviet Union where millions of Jews are persecuted and millions of Christians are severely restricted? There's peace and security in a prison. There's peace and security in a concentration camp. But is this the kind of peace we want? Freedom and justice are equally important. And whether we like to admit it or not, freedom is rapidly disappearing from our world. I've often wondered, what would happen in America if the zeal for righteousness that at times characterized ancient Israel, and which is reflected among many Jewish sons and daughters of today, was mingled? with the revival zeal displayed by early American Christians. 
I believe that God is calling us to some kind of an awakening. Spiritual renewal in America will come only if we follow King Solomon's admonition in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This quest for renewal demands from all of us the sacrificial commitment of self to God and to righteousness. We cannot stay as we are. We must not slide deeper in the direction we are going morally. We must change. We must move forward, not only materially and technologically, but morally and spiritually, if we're to survive. In the ancient synagogues of Israel, upon the completion of the reading of any of the books of Moses, it was the custom for the congregation to exclaim, be strong, be strong, and let us strengthen one another. In like manner, when we see each other as blacks or whites or Catholics or Jews or Protestants under the enemy's attack, let us encourage and strengthen one another. I would say tonight to both Christian, to black and white, and to Jew, be strong, be strong, and let us strengthen one another. Thank you very much.